Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to Benenden Hospital's webinar on foot, ankle and lower limb injuries. Uh, if you haven't seen me before, my name's Damien, and I'll be your host for this evening. So we've got two experts in this evening. Our expert presenters are Mr. Liam Stapleton, sports medicine podiatrist, and Mr. Mark Jones, consultant orthopedic surgeon. Now, this presentation will be followed by a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask any questions during or after the presentation, please do so by using the Q&A icon, which you'll see on the bottom of your screen. Now, this can be done with or without giving your name. So please note the session is being recorded if you do provide your name. Now, if you'd like to book your consultation, we'll be able to provide contact details at the end of this session. So I now hand over to our first presenter, Mr. Leon Stapleton. Hi there. Got to make sure this works. Are we doing? Are you reading this bit? Oh, oh that's we can start there. Sorry. We can start there. Yeah. Let's okay. Hi. Right. Um, thank you for having me. Um, thank you for everyone signing in to to listen to us talk about this, and hopefully you can um, find some of this a bit interesting. Um, so I said, I'm a specialist in podiatric sports medicine or a sports medicine podiatrist. Um, uh, my, my credentials there on the screen, fellow faculty of podiatric sports, med uh, podiatric medicine, the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow and the Royal College of Podiatry, um, uh, postgraduate certificates in po podiatric sports medicine and podiatric surgery and a special interest in foot ankle diagnostics and injection therapy. So um, we're going to talk over a few things in this session, um, and we've each got a, a few common, uh, mainly sports injuries that we find within our disciplines. Uh, this is, I keep going backwards on myself. Might use it to fix this, So first, uh, first uh, thing we talk about, a common thing we see is not foot and ankle, is lateral uh, ligament injury, uh, commonly people rolling their ankle or an inversion injury. Classically, we always, we've always always been told uh, the rice is the way to treat this, um, rest, ice, compression and elevation. Um, and and that probably in, in basic principles still stands. One thing that has changed, um, the British Journal of Sports Medicine uh, recommends now we use the um, the peace and love, uh, which changes things slightly. The main difference with this is avoiding anti-inflammatories in the acute stage, um, as this is thought to slow down your healing process um, and, and maybe slightly different to what you guys uh, uh, might do in, in orthopedics early. Um, and, and obviously to remove ice from this. Um, uh, and, and they've split this into two parts. So you have your acute stage and then as you start to get better, so you protect, elevate, avoid anti-inflammatory compression and education. Um, uh, and some of that is communicating with healthcare professionals. Um, and then obviously as things start to improve, you begin to reload the injury. Um, optimism, not sure where that fits in. I think they just needed an O. Um, uh, getting, the, getting your joint moving again to revascularize it and then begin to return to exercise. Um, lateral ligament injuries uh, can cause uh, osteochondral lesions and this is essentially uh, damage to the cartilage and uh, bone within the joint um, and, and are a difficult uh, problem in the ankle. Uh, to treat. Um, so we usually use an MRI scan to confirm this. Um, I think MRI scan is really the gold standard for uh, imaging for any ankle inversion injury, um, both for assessing the, the ligaments and, uh, and, and the damage to the underlying bones beneath. Um, uh, ways of treating this, if, if you have this and uh, and sometimes if your ligament, in, your ankle inversion injury is uh, severe enough, very often this may be uh, prophylactically um, uh, advised before you actually have the injury confirmed on MRI. Protecting the joint, bracing, or more often walking boot is recommended. 
crutches to completely offload and rest, um, compression elevation, medication. So uh, an analgesics, some of the, this is a kind of injury that sometimes uh, nostril anti-inflammatories are recommended for. Um, and, and there are certain medications that can be injected um, that reduce the friction within the joint if you were confirmed with uh, a, a osteochondral lesion um, and then obviously surgery. Surgery is difficult um, and and certainly surgeons prefer if we can treat these non-surgically uh, because the talus, the primary bone, the square bone within the ankle doesn't have a great blood supply so it doesn't tend to work as well for uh, uh, there's not as much bone marrow in it if you have for the uh, micro was a micro Micro fracture fracture, um, that you might might have in the knee. Um, Obviously, another uh, uh, common um, problem with the ankle and and depending on which sport you play, ankle impingement, um, or three types that I usually see, an anterior ankle impingement, uh, posterior and a lateral impingement. Uh, The anterior impingement is usually caused by uh, degenerative changes, osteoarthritic changes with the joint, and it's very often bony, not always, but very often bony, uh, where you have bone spurs begin to grow, and that can often be following a trauma um, and and uh, that the, the would damage the, the underlying bone. Posterior ankle impingement can be caused by uh, various uh, different problems. Um, one of the most common is a prominent back of the talus bone, the little square ankle bone that sits in the ankle socket. Uh, so you, you have a very prominent uh, posterior uh, part of that bone. You can also have an extra bone there, a nose trigonum. And this actually gets physically compressed when your foot is pointed. Um, the, the other way this commonly happens is if the posterior ankle uh, irritates the uh, tendon that moves your big toe. Um, the tendon that moves the big toe uh, can get uh, runs very close in proximity to that part of the joint, and so this is common in ballet dancers and footballers, uh, the two group, groups of sp- in the sporting world that you tend to see this most commonly. Um, and so, for some people, you get a combination of all three of those things. Lateral ankle is probably less a true impingement, um, and something we see with an adult acquired flat foot. So that's a foot that is. Uh, wasn't always flat and has become flat. Um, we tend to see that in in stage two of developing an adult quite flat foot, uh, where patients come in with pain to that lateral ankle. Um, how do we treat these? Uh, part of that would depend on what, which of these varying types you have. Uh, physical therapy um, is always part of treatment of most musculoskeletal sports injuries. They usually have a part to play in almost all. Um, offloading well, it can be ankle strapping and uh, can help foot orthosis, footwear activity modification. Obviously, that's hard if we're looking at a footballer or, or a ballet dancer. Um, but sometimes, if you have like a, a recreational runner, just changing the the angle of drop on their shoe makes a big difference um, uh, in 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 the mechanics the, through the ankle and takes a lot of stress off. That that can be enough. Injections, again, work better if it's soft tissue rather than bone, um, but you tend to have a lot of capsule of swelling in that also. Um, and then obviously surgery um, to debride or remove what we think, whatever we think might be causing uh, physical impingement. And if it's now quite flat foot to reconstruct that foot, which is no small surgery, but um, needed in some people. Uh, one of the most common things we'll see in clinic is plantar fasciitis. Um, it's estimated that 10% of the UK population will have it at some point in their life. Um, I prefer the term relative rest rather than uh, complete rest. So running within your load capacity, within within what's comfortable, but not stopping completely. Uh, rehabilitation, we know that strengthening exercises for plantar fasciitis work better than stretching exercises. Um, uh, uh, although stretching exercises are, are still probably somewhat beneficial to most people, um, but probably not optimal. Shockwave therapy, uh, orthotics, and corticosteroid injections are all uh, treatment options for that. What I try to do in clinic is work out 
which will I think will work best um, and if we see a, a very acutely inflamed uh, but not very degenerative plant fascia uh, uh, on ultrasound scan in clinic uh, then probably cortico and ste steroid injections probably most likely and then shockwave therapy more for those slightly chronic uh, cases but there was obviously some variation within that and we tend to see quite a few people two weeks before London Marathon uh, where, with plant fasciitis and and steroid injections seem to be the only way to go. So we'll cut the mustard. Um, what we tend to know is that people who rehab uh, their plant fascia well don't come back. And those that, those that don't do their rehab exercises uh, for quite some months after you got better, um, I usually advise that you do at least three months of rehab. Um, uh, then those that don't are more likely to come back. The, 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 the steroid injections themselves have a high recurrence rate anyway. Um, and probably the other most common thing I see in sports population is probably Achilles tendinopathy. So we're looking at pain and swelling around uh, the Achilles tendon at the back of the ankle. Um, what I would say is really they're usually not that inflamed when we see them in clinic and there's normally an element of chronicity to them. Um, and sometimes if we actually see a, 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 an actually uh, inflamed one, we we'll probably think it might not. It might be something else. Um, <clears throat> so we normally separate these into mid-portion and insertional tendinopathies and then subcategorize within that mid-substance tears, calcification, neovascularization, uh, paratendinitis, bursitis, Hagler's deformity, plantaris involvement, and, and obviously other uh, uh, systemic problems that might be interplaying with that too. So modification of footwear, two main things we might do. Make sure your shoes don't press or rub or compress uh, the Achilles tendon. We know the Achilles tendon has a, a low resistance to compression. Um, and it's estimated to be about 2% of its resistance to tensile force. Heel lifts, especially in insertional Achilles tendinopathy, help a lot. Uh, strengthening, again, over stretching exercises and stretching exercises have been shown to be provocative to insertional tendinopathy, so they're a big no at least until you're pain-free. Um, and then analgesics over non-steroid anti-inflammatories. Um, anti-inflammatories have been shown to reduce uh, the tenocyte uh, activity, which is the cells that will repair your Achilles tendon. You don't want them acting any slower than they uh, do already because Achilles tendon has a particularly poor blood supply and struggles to maintain any high level of uh, metabolism for repair. Um, other things we can do in clinic, shockwave therapy. Now, shockwave has estimated something like about an 80% success rate um, over three sessions for treating uh, Achilles tendinopathy. That's pretty good. Um, Hydrolyzed section injection, primarily for big portion tendinopathy, and usually indicated if there's signs of neovascularization. Uh, you might, might interpret that as, in, as inflammation in, in lay terms. Uh, within the mid portion uh, again probably estimated about an 80 percent success rate i'd probably say it's higher if you pick the right patient um prp injections have been shown long-term outcomes with those are good although the evidence base is is weaker than the other two injections surgery has its risks but um certainly for calcific and insertional tendinopathies where Haglund's uh, deformity is present uh, they're more in more indicated um and they can be the ones that really complicated to treat are we done on time we're right mm -hmm. yeah uh for ankle fractures so broadly speaking i tend to see stress fractures in clinic rather than acute uh fractures sometimes you get the odd one that's that not picked up in a and e in which case we refer them to good cells pretty pretty quickly <laughs> stress fractures usually we would manage them with uh, offloading um, and re and rest. So whatever we think is the prov provocateur, in which case for a lot of people running physical activity, whatever it is that's over and above walking around. Um, uh, physiotherapy orthosis, certainly as you are returning back to your sport, you know, I think you're something like three times more likely to have a second stress fracture after you've had the first, and if postmenopausal women, it's something like 27 times the risk. 
Um, we look at trying to look at reducing the risk factors as much as possible. Obviously, with fractures, surgery is um, is often the case. Certainly, if the if the fracture is severe enough in the foot and ankle, there are certain bones that are prone for difficulty in healing because they have poor blood supply. The one that comes to mind and is most routinely done in the sports world is a Jones fracture at the base of the fifth metatarsal. In most high-level sport, that is usually fixated. The recovery is about the same, whether you fix it or not, and guarantees recovery is, I think, it's about 10%. You might know, maybe you might better know a bit better, but I think it's about 10% of them are gone to non-union, which is quite high. And we can introduce Mark. I'll let you, I'll let you introduce yourself. Yes. Right. So, hello, everyone. I'm Mark James. Um, I'm a consultant orthopedic knee surgeon in East Kent Hospitals, where I practice mainly with knee, uh, sports knee injuries. Um, and this is through years of training. I went to Brisbane for my fellowship, where I trained the majority in sports knee medicine, um, but also trained in my higher surgical training in, in Surrey, Sussex. So I'm going to talk today about the common conditions in the knee that I see mainly in uh, sports knee injuries. So we're not going to talk about arthritis today or anything anything like that, but mainly the sports knee injuries. And we're going to talk about meniscal tears, patella dislocations, tendinopathies and ACL injuries. So to start with, the, what is a meniscus? Well, a meniscus is a shock absorber of the knee. It's, it basically takes the, the impact from the knee and takes it away from the cartilage and distributes the load. And there's a two, two meniscus within the knee, the inner or the medial meniscus and the outer, which is called the lateral meniscus. And the idea is this distribution of weight throughout the knee protects the cartilage and protects it from developing arthritis later on in life. So you can imagine having tears of this meniscus is, is not great. They tend to be broken down into two types of meniscal injury. You can have an acute traumatic meniscal injury, which is mainly what we're talking about today with the sports knee injuries. And these usually occur with a twisting and loading of the knee that causes a shear force of some kind onto the meniscus, which causes it to tear. And these can then be isolated and just have an isolated meniscal tear, or you can have associated injuries, other ligament injuries, chondral injuries within the knee. And most patients present with a sharp pain at the site of the tear, either on the inner aspect or the outer aspect of their knee. And then they get swelling of the knee over the next 24 hours, not an instant swelling, but something that comes on gradually. And with the meniscal tear, you may have mechanical symptoms. And the way I describe this is it's, it's like tearing a bit of carpet by your door. If you tear that carpet and it flaps up, then that carpet's going to catch on the door as you open your door and it's going to cause the mechanical symptoms. And that's exactly what the meniscus does as you try and do your range of motion throughout that knee. And again, it's important to take a full history, find out exactly what the mechanism was, make sure it was an acute traumatic meniscal tear and examine the patient. If you come to me with this history, I'll examine you and I'll, I'll try and see if it is tender because you will be tender around your joint line and where that meniscus is torn because it irritates the capsule. And also I might be able to feel a click within your knee or it may be locked. Um, and then I decide at that point whether I need to get an x-ray or well, the gold standard for these acute traumatic meniscal tears is usually an MRI scan to have a look at the soft tissue. This is compared to an atraumatic meniscal tear, which is less, it's less part of the sports knee injury in that it, usually the mechanism is unknown. Usually patients wake up with pain in their knee that they didn't have the day before, their knee's a bit swollen, and they can maybe add a pinpoint it to one side or the other, but it's usually because they've overdone something the day before without really knowing about it. Again, though, the symptoms are the same. So you get pain, you get swelling, uh, and the mechanical symptoms of clicking, catching, locking. And the investigations are fairly similar, except for the atraumatic meniscal tears. I tend to build in an x-ray into my investigations because this will tell me whether it's associated with an arthritic type picture. So the idea of this assessment is basically is, is, a, is a summary of the BASC guidelines. Now, the BASC guidelines is the NEAS Association, and they've basically looked at whether what happens with these meniscal tears and how we should manage them. The main thing is, is it an acute sporting knee injury that is locked? And if you've got a locked knee, which basically means you 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 cannot open your door because your piece of carpet is stuck in the way, then the and an MRI scan confirms it, then these tend to need an urgent arthroscopic meniscal surgery, usually to repair the meniscus if it's repairable. 
This is in comparison to those patients with arthritis within the knee that have um, an, an, a meniscal tear. And again, these ones don't tend to need any surgery at all, apart from maybe later on needing a knee replacement. We then have a group of patients in the middle, those patients with a meniscal target with an acute injury. These patients tend to do fairly well with um, an arthroscopic repair if it's repairable. And then the two types of patients that have ongoing symptoms with MRI scans confirming a meniscal tear, clinical symptoms pointing to the, the meniscal tear that are then picked up on the clinical assessment as well. And usually these patients can have a trial of non-operative uh, treatment, either with physiotherapy, um, offloading this knee for a period of time, maybe a steroid injection. And if this then fails, then surgical treatment can then go ahead after this, with either debridement or repair, depending on the type of tear. Uh, moving on to tendinopathy, it's usually a tendinopathy of the patella tendon, a bit, but a bit like what Liam was saying with the Achilles tendon. It tends to be a, an abnormal turnover of, of the tendon around the either the patella tendon or the quadriceps. And it does have two distinct barriers. Patella tendinopathy tends to be in the younger patients, or quadriceps tendinopathy tends to be in the older patients. And they tend to be overuse injuries. Again, I didn't realize that there was a new acronym, but I tend to use mice with movement. I quite like the need to continue moving, not to stiffen up, not to be braced. But icing helps, compression, bandaging can help as well, as well as elevation if it is a bit swollen. But the main thing is an eccentric exercise program through your physiotherapy. This is the mainstay of treatment. We then get those patients who are a little bit resistant and don't, and they don't get better with this physiotherapy. And, and they may benefit from these what are called Chopat straps, which are these braces which just shorten the patella length uh, slightly and just take the pressure off the patella tendon. We also talked about the shockwave therapy in the previous talk. And again, this has some benefit, but I don't think it's as good in the patella tendon as it is in the foot and ankle. And topical GTN may also increase blood supply to this area, which may again help the healing process and healing phase of this injury. Injections, again, last resort. Again, research doesn't show too much of a benefit, but it's sometimes better than the last resort, which is surgical excision, which can be a big painful operation with not guaranteed outcomes. Patella dislocations is another sporting injury I see quite a lot of. Um, these are usually non-contact injuries, but obviously can be a, a big contact rugby injury or footballing injury, but usually with some kind of rotation of the leg that causes this kneecap to twist out from its normal place. Usually what happens is uh, it usually self-reduces. As you straighten your leg and the quads contract, that brings the kneecap back over and you hear a clunk. And sometimes this does need reducing either by ambulance crew or by yourself or in hospital. The investigations, I always get x-rays and an MRI. And I always get x-rays just to see, make sure there's no fracture associated with this. And an MRI scan, I de it depends on the patella, on the history, on the patient and the examination on whether an MRI scan is warranted. But certainly in recurrent patella dislocations, I do because this then might help me plan surgery for later on. So in simple acute injuries, where this is the first time patella dislocation, you, the mainstay of treatment is physiotherapy. Um, again, bracing the knee initially for a bit of pain relief, but actually trying to get this knee moving to try and get the quads to activate and try and get them to not weaken as much. And occasionally these braces, which help the, the patella track can be used. If there's a complex knee injury, such as cartilage damage or fractures within the knee, then they may need urgent surgery. And in chronic injuries where there's recurrent dislocations of this patella, again, physiotherapy is still the mainstay of treatment to try and really control the, the movement of this whole lower limb to control the tracking of the kneecap. But you may need to have activity modification. And then we may need to consider surgery about whether we stabilize this kneecap with ligament reconstruction, bony procedures to change the alignment of the knee slightly or even to deepen grooves within the knee to try and let the kneecap track better. So the last thing I'm going to talk about is ACL injuries. These are quite popular at the moment in terms of they're on the news quite a lot. They, they were quite big around the time of the World Cup, the Women's World Cup, in that so many female athletes missed the World Cup this year because of ACL injuries. They're usually a non-contact pivoting injury. You've seen the typical Michael Owen injury where he was stood alone with the ball and his knee just gave way on him. And most of the time, patients will report that they have a pop within the knee 
It has instant swelling and pain, and they usually have to hobble off or be stretched off the pitch because they can't continue. You need to assess these knees for early, early because they can have associated injuries, associated meniscal injuries, other ligament injuries, which need to be managed. And again, early treatment might be of a brace just to take away the pain, and to take away the swelling, but early motion is key, as well as icing this knee to take away the swelling, compressing and elevation. And early MRI scan will give you the diagnosis. ACL treatment can be broken down into non-operative and operative. Early treatment is always with therapy, physiotherapy, whether we go down the operative route or not, because this will help build up range of motion, will have swelling control and uh, swelling management, as well as to build up the quadriceps as much as possible. ACL braces, such as this one in this picture, can be used to give control back to the knee long term. And it can also be used later on to protect any reconstructions or repairs that have been used, that have been done. Some ACLs can be repaired, um, but they're not as common as the reconstructions. And reconstruction is usually the mainstay of surgical treatment. I wanted to mention in this presentation a little bit about injury prevention, because I think given all, given the fact that ACL injuries are becoming quite common, and there certainly is, is there's a huge increase in, uh, in ACL injuries in the young, with 29 fold increase in the last 20 years. We need to try and do something to protect our young population as well as our female population from, divert, from having ACL injuries. Uh, the FIFA 11 plus program has been out for a few years now um, and is starting to become a bit more popular in this country. And it aims to basically have a preventative warm up program. So if you to introduce this into all sporting individuals from a young age in their PE classes, in their in their um, training that they do, then they will reduce the chances of ACL injury in the future. We're reducing it to about 50 percent overall in all athletes and actually reducing it by two thirds in biologically female athletes. So it is a really worthwhile program, which we should all encourage our kids, our friends, kids and everyone in school to take up so that we can reduce the burden that ACL injuries are having. It basically, you can get this from the Internet, from anywhere, and I'll show you a good website where you can get it from. But it basically goes through a 30 minute warm up that you should do in the introducers part of your um, training which goes through different steps and it shows you how to do the exercises and making sure that your knee's in the correct position and, or not. And once you've done this, you can introduce this into every training session you do. Again, we need to worry about biologically female athletes because they are higher risk of having a high, or they're more high risk of having an ACL injury. And it's not just based on um, the anatomy in that their legs, most, there's a lot of female legs, which are what we call knock need or valgus and their pelvis shapes but actually it can be hormonal. It can be the fact that football boots are designed for male feet and not female feet. And there's only a few brands out there which are designed for females and this can have an impact on ACL injuries. The pitches that females tend to play on are, not, are usually not the ones that the males are playing on and usually are not as good quality and so can introduce increased risk of uh, injury. And also the, this, the lack of strength and conditioning that female athletes have. There's a stigma behind it not to build up too big, so they're mus muscular. But also in academy age groups, if you're a male athlete going into an academy, you will get strength and conditioning training from in under nine year olds, whereas in females, it's in the under 12s when you've probably missed that boat. So they are more at risk of ACL injuries. This is a, a website which you can go to after the, power, the presentation, which is called Power Up to Play, which has been over the Sky Sports news recently. And it's been set up by a group of um, knee surgeons around the region. Um, and it's a charity focusing on reducing the knee injuries in, in the youth. It gives This is where you can download the booklet FIFA 11 and also look for how to do these exercises and local centres that you can go to to see how these exercises are done. So I do encourage you to go to this because I think it's extremely good to try and reduce our chances of ACL injuries in kids. And that brings the end, brings me to the end of my talk. So I think we go to the questions and answer session now. Lovely. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Uh, interesting one, both of you. Um, <laughs> it's, it's quite interesting that you mentioned that last section on sort of ACL and prevention. It's just simply warm up. <laughs> 
I was told at school to warm up, and I'm still being told to warm up now. And not warming up by stretching. So active, 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 active warm up active rather warm-up. than stretching. Yeah, but yeah. I think stretching might slightly increase your risk of yeah. of so the old fashioned stretch than we would have been taught when we were twelve years old isn't yeah. what would be done now. So it's kind of maybe taking a slightly more modern scientific approach to it. No, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Well, uh, yeah. So if you've got any questions, uh, please do pop those in the Q and A icon box now. Uh, but we have got some coming through. So we've actually got a 40-year-old marathon runner uh, who's had chronic pain in his ankle after an X-ray. X-ray. It looks like he's bought a borderline osteoporosis, um, a de degenerative change to an accessory navicular bone, um, and borderline degenerative change affecting the first MTP joint. Hope that makes a little yeah. bit more sense. Mm -hmm. uh, no swelling. But pain and stiffness, more so in the morning. Um, the question actually seems to be more geared towards, are there any supplementations uh, that he can take to help? Um, but perhaps maybe you can give us some insight into the, the condition in general. Or, okay. or... So what I'll probably say is first MTP joint osteoarthritis, um, which I think is what we mean here, rather than osteoporosis, is, uh, is the most common uh, asymptomatic finding on plain film radiographs so plain x-rays that is the most common thing people will find so that would be no reason to stop stop running um even if it was particularly sore um I, I, what i've found I've all, so when you have an accessory navicular and there are there are three different types of that but almost all people who have an accessory navicular tend to have a very flat foot and i wonder whether whether the pain is more coming from a flatter foot type trying to run rather than the degenerative changes with the ankle if it's borderline. So it'd be very difficult for for you to be able to tell which of was hurting more because you can get this lateral ankle impingement, as I was speaking about, um, sinus tarsi syndrome, or, or these things that are affected because the when you have this extra bone, this accessory navicular it puts uh, your tibialis posterior tendon at mechanical disadvantage. So what it means is that the tendon and that muscle that hold the arch up in your foot and effectively shock absorb your foot when you hit the floor when you're running um, is at a disadvantage. So it has to work harder than, say, the other foot. If it doesn't have that, that bone, the extra bone, or your best friend that's the same age and the same weight and runs the same as you, then their tip post tendon would have to work. So... so you, the force be going through your foot when you're running being four times greater running than walking it might be that that muscle is just not strong enough to work that hard in that situation i, I it's an interesting one um uh, so the, the borderline osteophytosis again probably wouldn't probably that wouldn't be enough to stop you from from running marathons like um, even if it was even if it was that being the, the cause of symptoms and certainly something should be fairly straightforward to, to manage in clinic i think probably the feeling is the accessory navicular may be more of a more of a problem than than anything else um supplements I'm not really a big supplement person to be honest um i try them if they're cheap and safe and see if they work and then if they don't don't waste your money it's probably what i would say yeah okay um, Perhaps maybe even for some just diet changes instead of supplementation. Maybe yeah. <laughs> well, no, so diet changes have been shown um, in, in patients who have a poor diet, have a leaky gut. That has been shown to increase the the symptoms of inflammation. Um, it doesn't sound like it's particularly particularly problematic. It's more of a, yeah. I, I, get, I guess more of a worry that it's a bit stiff and sore yeah. after exercise than than during. Um, but yeah, I think probably if it's caused him problems, yeah, we'll have, maybe have an appointment and we can we can assess what exactly is causing any of those symptoms. Okay, so, grand. Yeah, we can look at some um, special offers actually to, to take up uh, Liam on that on that offer. Uh, so we've got uh, Kelly asking why she might suffer some sort of unusual sort of sensations in her knee and groin after what looks like might be an ankle injury, um, particularly maybe, I'm guessing maybe a broken ankle. Um, I mean, ankle injuries Sorry, can I'm be guessing. quite nasty in terms of the soft tissue damage, nerve injury. Um, you can get chronic complex regional pain syndrome or CRPS, which can cause electrical sensations, burning pain that can go up and down. And it may be associated with that, but I think you probably need 
I think, and the clicking noise again. It is, the problem is with ankles, they scar up and there, there's not a lot of soft tissue protection really. So there's a lot of scarring around the ankle, which can bleed into the joint itself, which can cause stiffness. There's soft tissues around it. The ligaments can also be damaged. And I think this, the clicking with pain, something you should probably you know, get seen. Yeah, it sounds like there's not a lot of diagnosis so far in what's been, no. you know, I guess if she's walking badly, she's irritating mm. sciatic nerve and but pain, electrical pain in the hip and mm. knee can be coming from the top as well. Yeah. Um, probably, yeah. And further to your next question about can you get a tear in the knee material with a badly broken ankle? Yeah, similar mechanisms, you know, that inversion injury, that twisting can cause a twist in the knee. And because you're then so focused on your ankle because it's broken, you may then realise when you're re rehabbing and you're recovering that actually your knee is also just as painful and the meniscal tear hasn't healed or is having problems. So I think you need to yeah, get get to be seen about your knee as well because I think you, you can injure one mm. and the other at the same time because they're a the similar mechanism of injury. Okay, okay. Uh, we've got Eleanor asking, uh, I had my Peronus brevis repaired <laughs> with groove deepening uh, and had my... Perennial ligament ATFL reconstruction. reconstruction in July 2022. Still struggling with swelling and pain post surgery. Any recommendations to improve this? So obviously that's quite. It sounds like you had quite a bad, a bad injury, um, and and it sounds like you've had dislocation of the perineal tendons. Just kind of reading in with what you've had done. Um, you know, the the look, it depends exactly what exactly is hurting. Obviously, you've had ankle ligaments reconstructed. They tend to be slightly stiffer after reconstruction um and than than they were beforehand. Um so obviously that obviously like that can drive some symptoms. Probably most likely is perineal still tendinopathic. Um and obviously it takes a long time for them to strengthen back up, making sure you're doing the rehab. Probably would say surgery alone wouldn't be enough to get you back to 100%. And the kind of the rehab um, is a really important part. And probably, if you say, as important, probably getting that right as as anything you do in theatre. Um, and it's not easy to get it right. It's hard work and takes ages. And, you know, you've kind of got to make sure you've got someone good leading it also. That's, you know, certainly if you're sporting, then, then making sure someone has a background in sports physiotherapist who knows how to rehab you back to whatever the sport or activity that you you play and if someone's not experienced in doing that then you may well find you you leave yourself a little bit short um and you know under prepared for what returning to whatever activity you, you have um again probably have have a look and see what see what I think is driving some of, the, some of that pain okay grand grand uh so we've got Janet I, I think Basically, the more information you can provide, perhaps maybe the better and more precise answers we can give. But Janet's asking, asking, having recovered from a severe ankle sprain, I've suddenly experienced pain in the ankle bone. Severe pain. Would physio help? Then I guess, as a general rule, most physio. Yeah, look, seeing someone. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think uh, having someone assess it is um, is a good is a good idea, and probably you know. Once someone has seen it, then trying to judge whether physio would be, you know, I'd say if it's if I'm broken anything, then physio there's a good chance physio would but help, you know. Um, yeah, good. And and if it, you know, if they worry that something more severe, there's something more severe going on than than they could could deal with within their specialty, then hopefully they'd refer on and have, you know, have some imaging and some diagnostics done to to see what was actually going on. Okay, grand. So we've got. Uh... Anna, I have a partial tear of my right Achilles two years ago. I now I, I no longer limp, but I am aware of a lack of strength in my right foot and calf is causing me to walk, run unevenly. I now get pain in my left foot and Achilles after tennis twice a week and running a few times a week. Would a podiatrist be able to help with this? Yeah, so partial tears, mid substance tears are common. Um, certainly as you get older. Um, they were not necessarily a reason to stop. Uh, obviously, it's going to take a long time for you to get over that injury. Um, uh, what we know is that you can, that, that the likelihood is the tear stays. Certainly, if it's the, the mid substance, the, the, the tear will stay there and you strengthen all the tissue that's around the tear. 
rather than filling in the gap. Um, so radiologically, we often still see the tear well after, you know, possibly for the rest of your life. But we know that you can um, lay down more collagen fibers around that. So as long as the, the, the surrounding tissue is strong. Your Achilles has a poor blood supply, so it takes a long time to get over. And the older you are, the more likely it is to take you long to get over. And there are things that can that certainly can speed that process up, make sure the rehab's right. You're obviously doing a lot of exercise, um, more than average for the average 64-year-old. Um, so that obviously plays a part with trying to judge whether or not you're doing more than you can recover from, especially if you're not as strong. That 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 initial injury may still be underloaded if it's weaker and um, pain on the other side, certainly if that may well be where the majority of your propulsion is coming from. Um, that'd be the, the foot you push off with and start begin to sprint, play tennis, the, the foot you push off to change direction with. Um, you find ways of compensating. Sometimes you just end up overloading your good side too. Um, absolutely, yeah. One of the things we probably have a look at ultrasound scanning clinic See what's going on. Certainly, see what's going on to the the is the left one is the new side, and then um, and and see what's actually going on again. Good, yeah, thanks, Liam. Promising and keep going with that exercise. Really and really and well. actually, yet yeah, again on on Achilles, uh, someone's uh, ruptured their Achilles back in May. Maybe we can give them a little advice here. I'm due to have uh, an operation to rejoin it. Um, can I damage it while walking? My walking speed is affected yet. Can I damage further? Okay, so he's he, he's not had the re he hasn't had it repaired yet. Not yet, not yet. No, okay, it's not a long time for a repair. That's mm -hmm. uh, uh, you can damage it further. Depends how complete it was. Then often not one hundred percent. Are they? I think there's often you know ninety percent of fibers. Um, but yeah, certainly if it's not completely ruptured, then 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 you could probably damage it further. That. That sounds a bit long to have that operation done. Um, you know, I would say very often in those cases, would you say that the norm would be to boot it? And yeah, we we in East Kent we've got a protocol where we we boot majority of Achilles, Achilles stem as long as they're caught early in the acute phase. You can treat them non-operatively in a boot. Um, the ones that tend to be operated on are the ones now that are missed or misdiagnosed or delayed presentation, and therefore they're lengthened. There's nothing. The gap hasn't closed up and then we need to do something surgically to bring it together but may is a very long time so um i don't i don't quite know what's gone on or what's happened here so i think yeah definitely walking will be affected mm -hmm. um and i mean w simple walking but i wouldn't do too much more than that until you know until you've seen the surgeon and ask them because i don't without knowing the further details i wouldn't want to give much more advice on that apart from just be careful okay oh, okay interesting um, and somewhat maybe a little bit worrying as well. Um, do get missed. Yeah, okay. Um, what's the chances, oh, this is from Judy, what's the chances of getting, uh, uh, what's the chance of knee getting back to full recovery following a meniscus tear? I think it depends on the type of meniscal tear you've got, whether it's an acute injury, a chronic degenerative issue. And then the management and how quickly you present. So I would say for those patients who have an acute sporting knee and meniscal injury where I get to have an early MRI scan and early operation where I can repair the meniscus. I think the majority of these patients get back to full recovery fairly well. I think by about three months, they'll probably be starting sport again, avoiding deep squatting, um, but actually getting back to their exercise and hopefully will be pretty symptom free if it all heals by about the six month stage. Okay. Um, if this then becomes a, a degenerative meniscal tear that someone's being except the way the meniscal tear is being debrided, then again, the, the chances of full recovery are probably not as good because there's probably associated degeneration with that knee. So it all depends on the situation of that meniscal tear. Okay, we've actually got an anonymous uh, attendee has actually almost asked exactly the same question, but this time with an ACL injury. Um, so maybe a little bit yeah, more complex. so torn ACL injuries, can people return to full activity after completing after after surgery and yes you can so look at all the uh, professional athletes out there who are getting back it's not just professional athletes it's amateurs as well um, I think the only difference between a professional athlete and an amateur is the physio and rehab and the preconditioning that you've got so a professional athlete has a lot better condition than an amateur would 
And so getting back that range of motion, getting back the strength, getting back, the, and then the physio in terms of the training is a little bit quicker. So most athletes, professional athletes, will be looking to get back to sports around the nine month stage after an ACL injury. For amateurs, I would tend to suggest if you're not good at doing this for a living, I would aim for around 12 to 18 month stage. But, you know, some people are getting back at nine months if their physio goes well and they're good at they're committed. But certainly people, the reason I do ACL surgery is to get them back to full activity and to complete. But the issue mainly comes with psychological reasons. So a lot of people don't want to get injured themselves again and actually find getting back to surgery or getting back to um, sports is actually quite a psychological impact on them because they don't want to injure them. They don't want to have that 18 months recovery again. Mm. So they avoid the stuff they know may re-rupture. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Uh, so we've got Janice asking that she just had her left bimelio, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, ankle open reduction and internal fixation. Ankle broken both sides after fainting. Still painful with slight swelling. How soon after the surgery can metal work be removed? Is this right, that one more? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I've had a lot of metal work in the ankle, in ankles, and my advice to everyone is that i will only remove that metal work if there's a problem with the metal work for some reason i did you know a lot of in america in australia patients will have routine removal of metal work but in this country we don't remove it and actually the research has shown you don't need to have metal work removed unless there's an issue um however if you are to remove it then the reasons you're removing it for are usually infection or skin irritation or further surgery it needs something else doing um but you need the fracture to be healed before you can remove it you sorry i think our system which is still there went down and all the questions have now gone so yeah. i'm sorry we can't answer anymore okay all right well thank you um now if we hadn't managed to answer any of those questions i think they may have been captured somewhere uh, during the recording or, or somewhere via um, the Zoom platform. So what we do, we will, if you provided your name, what we will do is answer your questions via email. Um, so I'd like to thank you all for attending. If we can just move over to our last slide. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, never mind. Well, if we can't move on to our last, oh, here we are. So, so as a thank you for joining this session, what we are offering is 50% off the value of um, any consultation related to uh, Liam and Mark here. Um, a call back from our dedicated private patient advisor. Now, uh, for all of you, an email will go out tomorrow with a recording of this session and further information. Um, and updates on news and uh, on future events. So if you'd like to discuss or book your consultation, our private patient team can take your call up until 8 p.m. this evening or between 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. Monday to Friday using the number on the screen. So we'd be grateful if you could complete the survey when this session closes to improve, improve future events. Our next webinar is on cataract surgery, which you can sign up via the website. So on behalf of our presenters and expert team at Benetton Hospital, I'd like to say thank you for joining us today. And we hope to hear from you very soon. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.